Okay, so with that, we'll get started. Thanks everybody for coming to our inaugural Florida 101 webinar. Uh, we'll start with introductions. So my name is Kate Rose. I am your Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent for Charlotte County. We'll pass it off to Sarah next. Hi there, I'm Sarah Weber. I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Education and Training Specialist here in Charlotte County. And on to Jody. Hi, I'm Jody York, and I am the uh, Program Assistant for Florida Sea Grant in Charlotte County. And you will see one, at least one of the three of our faces on webinars going forward today. Sarah and I will be speaking and Jody will be helping us to moderate. But in the future, we have some really great guest speakers for you. And at least one of us will be on to help moderate and take questions. So with that, we'll get even further into it. Uh, by talking a little bit about what even is UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant. So Extension is a partnership between state, federal, and county governments to provide unbiased scientific research-based knowledge and expertise to the public. So basically in 1862, Abraham Lincoln was president at the time. He realized that there was a lot of research happening up at the university level that could impact agricultural yields, but it wasn't making its way down to the end users that needed it. And of course, that had a really big impact on the entire American population. So he set up the land grant university system and the cooperative extension system. And in the state of Florida, the University of Florida is the land grant university institution in partnership with Florida A&M University. And we partner to sort of operate through all of these different programs, which I've depicted here. Uh, the one that seems people seem to be the most familiar with is 4-H. As I said, I am your Sea Grant agent. Uh, Sarah operates a little bit more in the Florida Friendly Landscaping and the Florida Master Gardener space. I refer to her as one of the land lovers in our office. Um, but that's who we are. And we will put up our contact information at the end of this slide because on top of offering programs like this, uh, we're also available for questions. If you ever have any, we'll do our best to find you the answer or find somebody who can. So in addition to this program, we do actually have a website where you could scan this QR code here and learn a little bit more about what we do and other programs we offer. But just as an overview, um, I run a citizen science seagrass monitoring program called Eyes on Seagrass, as well as the Florida Horseshoe Crab Watch in the county. Sarah runs these, this, these programs called Florida Friendly Friday, a great speaking series that occurs uh, in the mornings. Upcoming dates are September 29th and October 27th about all things Florida friendly landscaping, gardening, how to function in uh, all things flowers and the ecosystem here in Florida. And she also runs Parks That Teach, which is on the first Saturday and the third Wednesday of every month of October through May in the Punta Gorda Library. Sarah, is there anything else that I can say about your programs or you can say about your programs? No, I think you you did well. Um, Parks That Teach, it's really great. It, it's master gardener led. Um, and it, they take a walk around the Punta Gorda Library. There's trails over there and uh, they talk about the flora and fauna and it's great, especially if you're new to Florida, they'll talk about all the plants and wildlife you see there and how you can utilize them in the landscape. Uh, so it, that's a really great program. Um, so that it starts back up in October. Cool, excellent. So with that being said, we'll get into today's programming, which is the introductory model of the Florida 101 webinar series, uh, which is meant to just be sort of an overview and a welcome to Florida, as well as a little bit of Florida history that you may or may not know as a seasoned or as a new Florida resident. So Florida was colonized by the Spanish. That first European settlement was in 1565, and that is actually up in St. Augustine. But of course, before the Europeans got here, there were you know, many, many indigenous tribes. One that was really common in the area where we're teaching this from is you know, in the salt, in the uh, South Gulf Coast of Florida is the, uh, the Calusa. And up in the panhandle, you guys might be familiar with the Florida State University ma uh, mascot is a Seminole. 
And one thing that was common to a lot of these tribes was the fact that they used to build these shell mounds, which you can see that picture here on the bottom left. And there's lots of stories of European settlers having to sort of trek up these shell mounds in order to have interactions with the tribe leaders. And a lot of them, even though we've developed a lot around it, uh, or around them still exist today. So again, down in our region in Lee County, there is a, a key, an island called Mound Key, and the whole um, island is effectively one big archaeological site. And then in 1821, we were acquired from Spain as a U.S. territory. And finally, just a couple decades later, we were admitted to the United States as the 27th state on the flag. And then we started to sort of make that transition into the Florida that we know and love today. A huge part of that was uh, timber uh, harvested from pine trees, which you can see here sort of in that middle picture. You guys, some of you may have driven, driven along either backcountry roads or highways, and you say, why are those trees planted in a perfect line? And that's because those are timber farms. So a lot of people, when they think Florida, think oranges, the timber was actually a really huge export that was really crucial to the economic well-being of the state. And once we had harvested a fair amount of the timber that was available in the state, there was this transition into cattle ranching. And that is sort of a really interesting measure that um, is used not only to, of course, continue to reap economically off the land, but also as a little bit of a conservation measure, right? Because it allows, um, you can't develop a cow pasture the same way you might be able to develop another kind of land. And sort of in a, to continue that history, of course, this is just a very brief overview. We thought a good way to go about that would be to review the state symbols of Florida. So we have a lot of really rich um, flora and fauna here. And to reflect that, our state government, our legislature has actually encoded, put in Florida law, that there are these representative species for the state. So we're going to go through each of those and sort of talk a little bit about the history and how they are a part of sort of Florida lore. Okay, so we are going to start with the state flower, which is uh which is the orange blossom. In 1909, the orange blossom was selected as the state flower by 1909 legislature. So the first person to bring over citrus to the new world would have been Christopher, Christopher Columbus in 1493. And then soon after that, in the mid 1500s, Spanish explorers began planting, bringing more over as well and began planting them in the St. Augustine area. So the first Commercial Grove was actually created by Jesse Fish of St. Augustine in 1763. And by the mid 1800s or so, uh, we had a lot, quite a lot of uh, orange groves and it, it, a, a commercial industry here. Um, one of the really neat things is that Florida honey, most of Florida's honey is produced from bees that gather orange blossom nectar. So you can often find orange blossom honey down here. And if you go to a uh, orange grove, uh, oftentimes you'll see, you'll see bees uh, uh, around that area as well. Um, what happened was um, they also chose a state wildflower, which is Coreopsis. And so the oranges, orange blossoms aren't native here, but the Coreopsis is. And so in 1991, Coreopsis was designated as the official wildflower. So there's a, a regular flower and a wildflower. Um, the Coreopsis start was used in roadside plantings and highway beautification programs. And uh, you can still see them along roadways today. It's a very common wildflower. There's about 14 different, uh, 14 native Coreopsis species in Florida. It's also called tick seed as well and you can buy it commercially it's a great landscape plant it uh, attracts butterflies pollinators and adds some color to your yard so i encourage you to uh, maybe try it it's not an expensive plant and most all native nurseries usually carry it and most local nurseries carry it as well moving on to 1927 is our state bird 
State bird is the mockingbird. One might think it was a flamingo or seagull, but uh, the state bird is the mockingbird. It's also the state bird of Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas. Mockingbirds are year-round residents. They don't migrate. We have a, a year-round population here. They're known for their loud, repetitive songs that they copy from other birds, animals, and humans. And they have their own songs as well, but they do mimic other noises, even sirens sometimes. They're very common. You see them probably every day. And uh, they'll live in your yard, urban areas, suburban areas, parks, forests. And the, their little eggs are so beautiful. You'll see them down there in the corner. They're blue and um, brown speckled. These guys are territorial. So if they, they will really protect their nests aggressively. So it is not uncommon if you walk by a nest that they will swoop down at you or swoop down at a dog or a cat. They'll at attack other birds. They are, they're pretty aggressive about their babies. They are super beneficial to humans because they eat a lot of insects. They eat beetles, grasshoppers, wasps, ants. Uh, they'll eat spiders, they'll eat snails, and they do also eat fruit and berries as well. 1953, the state tree was named, which it's kind of funny because actually palms are not trees. They're closely, more closely related to grasses, which is an interesting fact. Um, in 1953, the sable palm is the state tree, and then it was added to our state seal in 1970. It's also known as the cabbage palm, the palmetto palm, swamp cabbage tree. Uh, berries are beneficial to wildlife. The boots, which are these little things here uh, on the tree, they are habitat for small animals and just uh, some sable palms have boots all the way up and down. Some don't have very many at all. Some people choose to remove them, which if they're in their landscape, which is not necessary. Um, but they're all sable palms, whether they have, well, sable palms sometimes do have the boots and sometimes don't. The Seminoles use the berries in medicinal remedies. And the bud of the sable palm is, it's called heart of palm, is made to, uh, is used to make swamp cabbage. And there is a swamp cabbage festival every February in LaBelle. And uh, I've not been, but I heard it's uh, quite the fun uh, festival to go to. And um, it, I recommend you try it. I think I'll try it next year as well. And swamp cabbage, this is the heart of the palm right here, what they make the swamp cabbage out of. Okay, 1967, our state beverage. So orange juice is our state beverage. And it's interesting, in 1945, during World War II, a group of USDA scientists in Florida invented a process for making frozen concentrated orange juice. The frozen juice concentrate transforms orange juice to make it possible to get vitamin C to American soldiers during the war. Well, then not long thereafter, the war ended and then orange juice production went on to be a multi-billion dollar industry and Florida's most recognized signature crop. In 1967, a uh, legislator legislature designated orange juice as the official state beverage. And then in 2005, the orange, of course, was named the official fruit of Florida. And you might recognize that little guy, the Disney orange bird. He debuted in 1971 as a mascot for the Florida Citrus Commission. Oh, I went too far back. Okay, back to Kate. <laughs> and of course, when people think Florida, they think sunny beaches, beautiful blue water, and shells. So our uh, state shell was, was named in 1969, and it's actually the horse conch. So this picture is of a beautiful dried shell from uh, the Florida History Museum. When you see them in the wild, they might be um, really actually sort of a dark, deep gray on the outside, but you'll really be able to recognize them, but they have these like truly really bright 
orange um, openings right around um, sort of the part that you would put up to your ear if you wanted to listen to the ocean. The juveniles are actually that bright orange when they start out. So if you find little ones that are bright orange, that is also a horse cock. And these guys are really big. They can reach up to 24 inches in length. And just a tidbit for our shellers in the audience, you can um, recreationally harvest these guys. You do need a special license if you're going to harvest them commercially. But if you are going to harvest them recreationally, you can take the shell. You just have to make sure that it isn't containing a live animal. And I would check, give it a little shake as well, because even though the, sh the snail might be gone in there, it might not be presenting itself. Sometimes other little uh, like hermit crab, like critters like to get in there and use it as a home. I thought it was, was diligent to include in other contenders uh, section. And I put contenders in air quotes because these are animals that I think of when I think of Florida. I have no idea if they were truly considered when making this decision. But I feel like some of the animals that people associate a lot with Florida is, of course, uh, the Caribbean spiny lobster, which is found sort of primarily in the Keys, Everglades South. The Florida stone crab, of course, found sort of along the Gulf Coast, pretty much up the state of Florida. But the commercial fishery, I would say, really starts to, starts to taper out in that Crystal River area, huge in the Keys. Both of these two fish, I think, are the top two uh, commercial, top two highest value commercial fisheries in the state of Florida. Scallops, of course, it's currently scallop season, and you can find a ton of resources on how to sustainably harvest those in the right way on the Florida Sea Grant website. And then, of course, oysters are something we hear a lot about as well, whether it's for restoration and ecological purposes these days. But of course, in the state of Florida, we also used to have a really thriving oyster fishery up in Apalachicola before it crashed. Waiting for my slide to advance. Hopefully it'll yep. go. I'm. It's not advancing for me. It's not advancing for me either. There we go. Perfect. 1975 was also a really big year for aquatic life in the state of Florida. Both the manatee and the dolphin earned themselves a an honor. The manatee, oop, I'll back that up. Get rid of that animation. Um, but the manatee earned itself the title of state marine mammal, and the dolphin earned itself the title of the state saltwater mammal, both in the same year. I cannot explain why, because they are that marine and saltwater are practically synonymous. I get that they're, you know, the fun charismatic megafauna that everybody likes to see in the in the state. But if you will allow me, I am going to make a brief case as to why if you were going to pick just one of these animals. Oh, God, I'm hoping my animations will work here why you should pick the manatee. Hopefully the animations will load as I'm talking. Manatees, we love them. They're a little, they're, despite the fact that they're really big and really powerful, they're ultimately really docile. They were originally, not originally, in the early 2000s, they became endangered a lot because of boat strikes. And then of course, I'm sure people have been hearing a lot about the loss of seagrass and the Indian River Lagoon, which is a huge food item for them. So much so that uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission actually started feeding them um, romaine lettuce over there to keep them fed. Dolphins on the other hand, and I really hope this animation works. Ha ha, it does are a little devious. I mean, we love them because their face is built into that natural smile, but they're very smart. And as a result of being very smart, they can sometimes be very mean. Um, in, a, in Charlotte County, we have challenges a lot. Charter fishermen, you know, have issues where dolphins are stealing bait off of their hooks, which is really challenging for their business, or bait and catch off of their hooks, which is really challenging for their businesses. Dolphins are known to be pretty randy. Um, and on top of that, there has been, they've been documented as doing things like punting fish around for fun. And yeah, so that is my case as to why, if we were gonna pick one, that we should pick the, the manatee to represent the aquatic mammals of Florida. Okay. Waiting for my slides to advance again, but while we wait, 1975 was a really good year. I don't know if it'll work for you on that's on your side, Sarah. I'm trying. 
Yeah, it's just slow, it's lagging, I'm sorry. That's okay. You can just click through all the various animations on this slide, that should make it easy. Um, so 1975 was a really good year for our aquatic resources in the state of Florida. The saltwater fish was also named is the Atlantic sailfish and the freshwater fish was named as the large mouse bass. Large mouth bass. Again, I'm going to do my due diligence and represent some other contenders, some people, some fish that people think of when they think of Florida. That fish in the top right with the beautiful sort of blue, green, and yellow coloring is a mahi-mahi or a dolphin fish. They're a pelagic fish that can be found on both coasts offshore. And this is, I've had this encounter with a couple of uh, people that are new to the state where you say, oh, I'm going to get a dolphin sandwich. And they're horrified. People, this is also called a dolphin fish. So I have to assume that most people, in fact, I have not heard of a single person eating a dolphin, but when they're saying they're going to have dolphin or dolphin fish or mahi mahi, this is the fish that they're referring to. Snook are also a really big um, fishery, uh, target fishery around here. Unfortunately, I don't think we can target them for keep at the moment, but they're a really fun fish uh, that recreational anglers target. And on top of that, they're expanding their range, their range in the state as waters continue to warm. And then another thing that you might see, even if you're not a fisherman, you've probably seen it on a restaurant menu, is the various type of groupers that we have in Florida. So I've covered my pelagic fish with that mahi-mahi. Snook are kind of estuarine. They are, um, they can live in either freshwater or saltwater, and they do depending on the different temperature ranges that they're trying to shield themselves from. Groupers are kind of in that in-between territory where they're definitely marine fish, but they tend to be a little bit shallower and tend to be sort of fo focused more on the bottom and on reef-like habitats. Gonna advance again. Perfect. And in 1982, the Florida Panther was named as the state animal, um, probably largely, and it was selected by student vote, and largely probably in part because it was this exact year that, um, that this animal was designated as critically endangered. So this used to be an animal that was native to, or that is endemic to Florida. We, with our development, um, and between vehicle hits and developing their habitat um, have sort of fractionated their ability to move back and forth across the state and breed regularly. And as a result of that, they're also currently federally protected. And so it was, a, it was acknowledged as endangered in 1982 and then later in the 90s, there was actually an effort because the population had become so constrained and segmented, there was a lot of inbreeding going on. There was only 15 to 20 animals left down here in South Florida. And, you know, when you get inbreeding, you get lots of diseases and genetic deformities. And so um, actually the American puma, which is a species that's very similar to it, the ranges actually used to be connected. Uh, before, you know, we moved in and developed everything throughout the Gulf. Uh, pumas from Texas were brought over and allowed to breed with the population to sort of revamp that genetic diversity. They were allowed to breed for a couple years and then they were eventually removed and transported back to Texas. And ultimately that's been a really huge success. So you can see on this map below that the that orange region is the breeding region, which used to be a lot small. And the reason it's kind of smaller than the blue region, which is just where they've been sighted, is because those male pumas will move away from the pack once they're grown. But of course, you need males and females to breed. So it's kind of constricted to that female movement, but it's been growing a lot. And if you're interested in helping, um, you know, reporting a sighting or doing any work to help with it, you can scan these, uh, this QR code that we have on the page as well. Okay, 1987. Don't do this. <laughs> um, the state reptile is the American alligator. And of course, it is very illegal to walk your pet alligator on the beach. There's a lot of wrong things with that. So anyway, alligators can go to 14 to 15 feet long. They were actually classified as endangered um, in our state in 1967 and federally in 1973. There was a lot of hunting during the 1900s 
And so after being listed under the Endangered Species Act, hunting was prohibited and the habitat was protected. Um, and they eventually came off the endangered species list in 1987. Uh, and they are pretty much everywhere water is at this point. Uh, Stormwater ponds, they can be in canals, they, lakes. You, if there's water around you, be cautious. Um, things to remember, uh, be aware of your surroundings, be aware of dogs, they're opportuni opportunistic feeders. They, if they see something close, they can grab it. And please don't feed alligators. Um, it is illegal. And what happens when people start feeding the alligators is they become used to humans and then they become a nuisance and not only a nuisance, but dangerous. And then um, when they become a nuisance, uh, they likely will get trapped and euthanized. So it's a death sentence really for them. Um, they are federally protected. Uh, it is illegal to kill, injure, or own an alligator with a per without a permit. And Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, does regulate alligator hunting. And um, so there, it, it is legal parts of the year, uh, but they do regulate alligator hunting and trapping. And if you do have an alligator that is true, Truly, really, truly a news that is um, endangering uh, humans, then you would call Florida Fish and Wildlife to let them know. But most of the time, Florida is a lot about coexisting with all the creatures that live here. Um, if the more you learn about them and the more you know about them, uh, the easier it is to um, quote unquote get along with them and coexist. Um, because there's a lot of things down here that, of course, are not up north that you may not be used to, but they all play a part in our ecosystem. So um, I just encourage you to learn as much about the, our local wildlife as possible. And it, it's quite interesting and it makes it easier to, to live around them. Okay, moving on to 1996 is the state butterfly. The state butterfly is a zebra long wing, which you see in that bottom left picture. They usually have a little bit brighter yellow stripes. Um, this picture, they almost look white. They're a really cool butterfly. They're common in Florida. They live a longer life than most butterflies. They actually ingest both pollen and nectar, which provides them more protein. And so they can live um, a couple months as opposed to just several weeks like many other butterflies. So their larval host plant are passion vines and passion flower. So that basically means they, they will only lay their eggs on passion vines, passion flower plants. Uh, and then once they lay their eggs, those eggs turn into caterpillars, which then eats the plant. And then of course they go off and make their chrysalis and turn into the butterfly. Um, that plant on the top right there of the screen that is our native corky stem passion vine. It's not a very showy plant. It has a very tiny flower, but zebra long wings love it. Uh, and then the background picture there is another native passion vine we have here. And it's called, the common name is Maypop passion vine or Passiflora incarnata. And that is a very showy plant. It is absolutely gorgeous. You see it out in the wild, and now they do sell it in nurseries, and uh, it's a it's a beautiful landscape plant as well. The plant itself does get a little aggressive, so um, it can kind of take over, but um, but it is quite beautiful. Um, there are two other butterflies that lay their eggs on that plant, by the way. Anyway, back to the zebra long wings. Their range is in Peru, South America, and then as far north as Texas and Florida. And the last here is our state dessert. 2022, the state dessert was named. Now, key lime pie was designated as Florida state pie in 1994, but we needed more sweets. So 2022 state dessert, st uh, strawberry shortcake, and the Florida Strawberry Festival is held in Plant City, Florida, 
Florida every year in March. This There's a lot of festivals to go to down here, by the way. The festival's been held every year since 1930, with a small exception of a six-year gap during World War II. And our region's strawberries, or that region's strawberries, account for 75% of the United States winter strawberry crop because the temperatures are mild. Um, we are second in the United States for strawberry production. Uh, the first in line there is California. And let's see, any other fun facts? Oh, yes, 200,000 strawberry shortcakes are served at the Florida Strawberry Festival each year, and they're the festival's signature dessert. My slides are, there we go. Perfect. And that brings us to the end of our very first webinar. Uh, before our beautiful faces appeared there, uh, for anybody who wants to send us a direct question or can't stick around for the Q&A that is coming up, that picture below, some of you might recognize it as the skunk ape, the, you know, basically the Florida and the uh, Southeast equivalent of the Bigfoot, of the Sasquatch that lives in the Everglades. So this is sort of the famous picture of the skunk ape that was taken by Dave Sheely in 1997. And Dave Sheely is actually the head, the director of the Skunk Ape Research Center in the Everglades. So something to keep your eyes out for on the road or if you ever end up out there in the wilderness. Um, okay, so with that being said, I'm going to launch that poll that I mentioned earlier, and we will sort of go through the chat here while everybody answers that and try to answer as many questions as we can. So thank you all for attending, and if you have to go, we will hopefully see you again at our next one. Okay, so I have scrolled to the beginning of the chat. And one of the first questions that we got was from Lori Tanksley. I really apologize if I butcher the pronunciation of your names. She said, I heard that the scrub jay may take the mockingbird's place as our state bird. Is there any truth to that? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, no, you go I'm ahead. I'm sorry. If you know the answer, you go right for it. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, yes, there was a bill introduced actually in January of this year to transition the state bird from the mockingbird to uh, the scrub jay. And that is because the scrub jay is actually Florida's only endemic bird. So we thought that was important to represent. Did I miss anything, Sarah? Nope, you got it. Perfect. Lori said swamp cabbage is delicious and everybody should give it a try. Angelina Ross said, do I have to, um, would love to try swamp cabbage. Do I have to learn to make it on my own or find, or, or find it in a restaurant somewhere? Um, there are some restaurants that do serve it. With that being said, um, I know there are a couple of street vendors here that make it as well. I cannot think of their names for the life of me, but if you Google probably Swamp Cabbage, Charlotte County, you should probably be able to find some place that sells it. Or you can go to that Swamp Cabbage Festival that we oh, that we mentioned. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> As well. Um, Lori asked again, she said she's read recent posts of panther sightings up in the Peace River near Charlotte and the Charlotte and DeSoto County line. So that is, that's true. So part of the geographic expansion of that breeding range as a result of sort of bringing the Texas Panthers in to diversify the genetic pool is that that genetic, that breeding ground has been moving north. So that post that you've probably seen, it made really big news. Everybody was super stoked that, like I said, the males tend to venture farther from the pack but the fact that they were starting to see a female expansion range as far north as Charlotte and DeSoto counties is really exciting for folks because that means that that breeding ground is is expanding. Did I miss anything, Sarah? No, I don't think so. Can you just scroll here? And I think that's it for our questions. 
Very good. All righty. Well, thank you guys so much for spending your lunch hour with us and for answering our poll. Um, you can join us next week. Uh, we will have the County Extension Director, Ralph Mitchell, and he will be answering the questions, sort of kicking off the first official subject matter webinar of Can I Touch This? And Ralph is the uh, authority on all things creepy, crawly, prickly. So it's sure to be a great lecture. Thanks, guys.